All right, so uh, a couple of quick admin slides to kind of get out of the way. Um, John Clark, nice to meet everyone. Um, I've been doing digital marketing since about 2005. Uh, you got a quick introduction of kind of some of the places I've been, uh, Microsoft, uh, NBC, and uh, at Razorfish, uh, I managed the national SEO practice for a number of years and actually met my current business partner. Um, the two of us run uh, Moving Traffic Media. We're based out of White Plains, New York, just a short uh, train or uh, car ride outside the city. Um, and I know we don't have necessarily time for questions afterwards, so if you do have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'd be happy to engage with you guys after the, after the conference. So uh, real quickly, I have a confession to make. I'm, not someone who I would consider a great writer. Um, most of my career up to this point has really been focused on the technical and the analytic side. Um, but the synergies of kind of SEO and content optimization um, have really kind of set up the opportunity to uh, write content for the web in a unique way. Um, and uh, I've had to work really hard at it. Um, uh, over the years to really uh, turn into someone who can create content, get content published. And I've been fortunate enough to have content published across Forbes, have a regular recurring art uh, column on Search Engine Journal, and a lot of other places. And that has kind of accumulated through uh, a lot of research, a lot of industry study, and a lot of practice. And so a lot of these tips are hopefully things that I learned along the way through trial and error that hopefully, even if there's one thing that you can take away and apply to your own content, um, that would be awesome. But uh, one of the things that I've found, and, and probably uh, many of you in this room have also found, is that the publishing or clicking publish is actually the easy part. Um, the, the challenging part is getting that content ranked, um, showing up in Google, uh, it's getting users to actually engage with that content. Um, and just consider this. Um, anyone have any idea what this number represents? <laughs> Uh, so the number of blog posts that are posted every day. Um, so if you think about that breadth of content that's being uh, published, the kind of idea behind content strategy, um, it, it has to evolve beyond an idea. For a lot of companies, it really now has to become um, a requirement in order to get the content that's being created actually published, um, ranking, and engaging with users. How about this one, 2.6 seconds. So uh, the amount of time that you have to capture a user's attention. So you know, the, the headline, the ability to make content scannable so that uh, if a user comes in with a particular question, they don't have to read the entire piece of content to, to determine uh, exactly what um, their answer is, is also becoming extremely important. So almost writing for the web is a unique skill um, that hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk through. So the next time before you click publish, um, you know, consider a couple of these uh, simple things that you can apply to your content. Um, and, you know, hopefully through this process, uh, you know, you'll be able to apply some of these little things that will increase engagement uh, with each piece of content that you're publishing. And one of the things that we know is with increased engagement, uh, engagement oftentimes there's increased sharing as well. So you get kind of a, a broader um, uh, consumer base to expose your content to. And if users are engaging, if they're sharing your content, there's a higher likelihood for those consumers and those readers to come back to visit additional content in the future. Um, but not only doing that, what we often find is what's good for user experience or UX is also very good for SEO. So doing some of these elements, many of these elements, will also uh, improve your opportunity for ranking that piece of content as well. And it takes probably less time than what you're anticipating. So if you're investing the time to create that piece of content, going a little bit of an additional uh, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, to make sure that that content is as discoverable as possible uh, is definitely worth the effort. All right, so here we go. So one of the first things for me, um, not being a writer by nature, one of the most important things is to remove the distractions so that I can really focus in um, and, and focus on the topic at hand. So this is probably the, the simplest application of that. We tend to be a WordPress uh, agency. Most of our clients are on that platform. Our website's on that platform. They have this nifty little distraction-free writing mode button that once you click it, kind of removes all the excess activities that are happening across the sidebar. So you're really able to focus in on exactly the topic or the content at hand um, and, and focus your attention there. One of the other favorite tools that I have is freedom.to. Now there's a lot of tools that 
uh, our, our life is, but essentially you're able to define the websites, the applications, et cetera, um, that you do not want to be able to visit. So essentially they will manually block those from you being able to uh, go and, and waste time there instead of focusing on your writing. Now one of the reasons I like this one is it's applicable across platforms. So uh, a lot of them are desktop only. This one actually translates across to your mobile phone, to your tablet. So you can't necessarily go and cheat in, on, on your mobile phone if you're um, uh, only blocking things on, on your desktop. One of the others is coffeeactivity.com. So I tend to like to work in coffee shops in general, but especially for writing, the ambient noise is very helpful for me. But oftentimes, or not always, can I get to a coffee shop? So this is a, uh, a free uh, website that kind of provides you these ambient noise soundtracks. So if you like the background noise in Paris, for example, <laughs> or if you uh, like the noises of a coffee shop, you can kind of play this uh, in the background, zone out, and really focus in on the piece of content that you're focused on. So second, optimize your, your post titles. So we'll take a little bit of a different approach than what you might think of a traditional SEO optimization. Um, but remember, four million articles every day, 2.6 seconds. The title is really the most important uh, component for SEO, but also for uh, capturing your users, bringing them in to engage with the content. And there's two great tools that we tend to kind of use together to really formulate a great headline. Uh, the first is from CoSchedule, it's the Headline Analyzer. And it's a relatively simple tool, you type in your headline, and it looks for uh, the uh, number of uses for common words, for power words, emotional words, and it essentially gives you a score. So score of 64, you can see I can do a little bit of work on the headline for this uh, presentation. Um, but it's a very simple and free tool uh, that's available on, on the web. The other is from the Advanced Marketing Institute. So this actually looks at the emotional uh, connection that a consumer might have with your headline. So if you think about ways to entice a click, it's through emotion, it's through power words, um, it's through the structure of the headline. So the combination of these two tools is what we typically use to really formulate a great headline that drives click through and drives engagement. It's also great for social sharing. Um, you know, as you're scrolling through your feed, um, you know, the headline is really the first hook uh, to pull someone in from, from a social platform as well. Um, so the other is to use a great editor. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not an editor by trade. Uh, this is another free uh, tool that is very, very useful. It's called the HemingwayApp.com. You can actually type right within the platform on the web, uh, or you can copy and paste content that you might have created elsewhere. But essentially the design of the tool is to minify your content. So it might be a little, um, uh, not kosher with what is often being talked about, which is long form content, right? Long form, 1,500 words, 2,000 words. The idea here is actually to make it as concise as possible. Um, and we believe that, you know, if a topic requires four to 500 words, you write four to 500 words. If it requires 1,500, then you write, then you write 1,500. The goal is to um, provide the best piece of content for the consumer that answers their question as quickly as possible. And this kind of helps you remove um, <coughs> long, uh, longer sentences that might be run on or include extraneous words that just aren't necessary. The design or the goal is really to kind of minify that content down so this is as easy to digest as possible. Um, number four, uh, proofread, spell check. Um, really, uh, proofread, spell check. There's no easier way to uh, lose trust with your readers, with search engines, uh, than having a lot of misspellings, a lot of broken links across your content. Um, another great free tool is Grammarly, um, it's specifically for, uh, I use it on Chrome at least, but the great thing about it is that it lives across all of your Chrome tabs. So whether you're writing an email, whether you're writing a blog post, uh, whether you're filling out a contact form, it'll work across all of those applications. And it not only looks for misspellings, uh, but it also looks for uh, improper word use, um, where you might need a hyphen. It's, it's a great tool that I use hundreds of times uh, every day. So number five, make it scannable. So we'll spend a little bit of time here. I think of all the, um, of these nine things, I think this is probably one of the most important. And it's a little bit of a, of a shift from what you might think of as traditional content writing. So um, editorial, PR, uh, writing for print. It's very different than what we're finding uh, that needs to be engaging on the web. 
So if you think about how you digest content, myself included, it's much more of a, a scanning environment, right? You pull up something on your phone, you're, you're, you're swiping to try to quickly find the answer you're looking for. And so structuring your content um, is super important to allow for that to happen. So you can quickly um, allow the user to find what it is they're looking for. So a couple of rules of thumb. One is no more than four to five lines per paragraph. So think about very, again, short, concise. The Hemingway app helps a lot with this, kind of trimming things up, making them more digestible. Uh, the second is use numbered and ordered lists. Far too often we see kind of long sentences that list out um, everything from ingredients to um, top travel locations, you know, whatever the thing might be, um, kind of ordering them out in a bulleted list, numbered list, is extremely um, easy to do, but also allows for the consumer to quickly find all of those things without having to dig into the content itself to discover what those elements are. Uh, next, um, think about two to five paragraphs between headings. So if you're thinking about a you know, long form piece of content, kind of structuring that content in specific buckets, and then kind of filling in those buckets with um, some, again, short, concise uh, sentences and paragraphs. And speaking of headings, use real headings. So H1s, H2s, H3s. The goal of really any piece of content on the web, especially for search engines, is that you're forming an outline for them to follow. And that outline should help reinforce the overall theme of whatever that piece of content is. So very much like how you would create an outline for um, a research paper or even a book report maybe in high school, the, head, the H1 should be your primary topic of the page. The H2 should reinforce that H1, H3 should reinforce that H2, and all of them should have some uh, semantic or, or linguistic relevance to kind of formulate the entire theme of the page. So the search engine crawls from top to bottom, they're constantly hitting these um, key signals that help them inform what that piece of content is about. So very often we'll see headings structured like this, which is basically just you know, a, a bold um, headline that doesn't have the same necessarily effect as using what we would call a real headline, or those H1s, H2s, H3s. So this is a very simple modification that most CMS platforms have the option to kind of select that, uh, that heading uh, tag. So this is a real life example. So we work with um, Christie's uh, Real Estate. And you know, imagine this post is actually, or this page actually has six to seven additional paragraphs under this. Just long blocks of content very difficult for a consumer to digest. Might be great for search engines, um, but there's better ways to structure it to improve the user experience um, and to provide search engines more signals about what this content is about. So when we started working with them, we applied a lot of these principles. And this is what this piece of content can become. Now you kind of understand exactly what the topic is, you understand the subtopics, we even bro broke out some of the things related to bookstores. So if I'm uh, living in Paris or considering relocating to Paris, um, this content becomes a lot more useful for me to immediately pull out nuggets that would be interesting or important for me. So this is a great application of including multiple different heading tags, ordered lists, shorter sentences, uh, and again, much more readability for consumers that are, that are across the web. And it's much better for SEO. So we're giving more signals through that heading tag structure about what that page is about uh, and potentially improving the opportunity for those pages to rank. So number six, optimized images. Uh, so this is an important one, especially as site speed has become more important for post ranking, but also user experience. Um, typically when we see a very slow loading page, and you guys probably have experienced this as well, you'll leave and go somewhere else that loads a lot faster. Images are one of the key ways that we can kind of control um, at scale uh, a lot of that page speed input. So first and foremost, don't use stock photos. I mean, who really works like this with sharp objects and scissors <laughs> up against your arms? Um, so a good rule of thumb is to make all the images the same width. So that at least um, requires every image that gets uploaded to have some sort of treatment um, in terms of the scale of that image. So by um, properly applying the width, you uh, don't require the website architecture itself to kind of shrink and contract the images um, which can increase your load time for that particular page. So a simple way to do this if you're on a Mac, uh, go to the preview tool, uh, go to the tools section, simply adjust the size, uh, and choose whatever that, that column width is. A good rule of thumb is, you know, if you're writing a blog post, whatever that blog post template is, um, in terms of the column size, just use that as your standard uh, for your images. If you're on a PC, sorry, you might have to use Microsoft Paint or something like that. Um, if you know of any other tools, I'll be happy to add them into the blog post. But 
Uh, so the other is uh, compressed images. So aside from the image size, this is arguably one of the most important things for images, is the compression. Oftentimes we'll find images that are multiple megabytes in terms of size, and that's, um, again, one of the most impactful things for site speed. Imagine all the different images that might be included in a blog post. If you're downloading all of those every time, especially to a mobile device, this can become a super heavy load uh, on that page load uh, speed. Um, so one of the things we know is that page speed impacts ranking, so it is a ranking factor now, so it will um, improve your opportunities for uh, SEO optimization, but it's also better for your users, and uh, we've seen it actually improve um, conversion rates as well. So if you're on the e-commerce side, um, uh, focusing in on, on uh, faster site speed can help improve your, uh, your e-commerce and your, your revenue overall. So a great free tool, again, this is for the Mac, it's imageoptim.com. Uh, you can download this to your desktop. Uh, you can upload images at scale. So if you have 20, 50, whatever the number is, you can upload them all at once, compress them all at once, download them, and you have a nice um, uh, optimized image. If you're on a PC, you can actually use the uh, online interface of the tool. It has a lot of the same functionality. You can still upload images at scale. Um, it's a great, again, free resource for image compression. All right, so number seven, link when it makes sense. So this is uh, a little cumbersome. You don't really know where to click. Uh, you don't know necessarily where you're going to be taken when you actually click that link. Um, and a much better application is something like this. So again, we apply our uh, trim sentences, our shorter paragraphs, and we're only choosing internal links that have some sort of relevance or give away some sort of hint about what the consumer would actually um, engage with when they actually click that link. Um, you know, a good rule of thumb is don't overwhelm your readers with too many options. Uh, if you think about all the choices that are available, sometimes that's paralyzing and you end up making no, no choice at all. So making sure that you're um, choosing links that will actually drive a consumer to something that makes sense and is related to the article. And ultimately, just ask yourself, will someone click this? If the answer is no or maybe, it's probably a best practice to not include it in the piece of content. All right, number eight, uh, don't keyword stuff. So we've all seen content that looks like this, where it's clearly written for SEO, and the primary keyword or keywords are unnaturally stuffed into every place that you can. Um, it's a poor user experience. Um, users are getting much more wise as to why that keyword is constantly visible in the content. Or we've seen stuff like this, which is a, you know, a block of content that lives at the bottom of a category page or a product page, um, just really unuseful. Um, so one of our favorite tools that we've been using internally is called Market Muse. Um, this is not a free tool. Um, it's actually a little expensive, but if you're creating a lot of content at scale, it uh, can be extremely useful for you. So I'll try to explain what this screenshot is showing. So essentially, your inputs are either your copied and pasted content or a URL that already exists on the web, and then you're choosing your primary keyword. Um, the tool goes out and scrapes the content that is found across the top 20 uh, pages ranking for that particular term. And the goal of this tool is to um, align better with how search engine algorithms are shifting. It's no longer about the number of times you include a single keyword in a page. It's more about the thematic and overall relevance to the topic. So the, the goal of the tool is to identify um, across the top 20 what sort of keywords or phrases are being used to support that overall theme. So this example is for real estate investment, and you can see that the tool is highlighting uh, words like property, commercial, real estate investors, um, uh, self-directed IRA, which is a way to invest in, in real estate. So it's kind of, uh, the goal is to um, provide a much better view of the overall thematic topic, and providing you the number of times you use that keyword versus the number of times the tool is seeing it used across the top 20. It's a pretty powerful tool. It also shows you the average number of words um, for the top 20 compared to your own and gives you a target, uh, both from a target score as well as the number of keywords that you should strive for if you want to potentially capture that number one ranking. So it's a completely different way um, of, of thinking about content than what we've been traditionally used to, but it's um, proving very valuable for, for us and our clients. All right, home stretch. Number nine, publish elsewhere. Um, so you know, we often get asked, well, if I'm investing in creating the content, why would I even consider uh, promoting it elsewhere or, or publishing it elsewhere? And I think the, 
The simple reality is oftentimes if you can identify where your target consumer lives, that audience is probably larger on that third party site than what you might have yourself. So the goal is obviously to get that content or get that message in front of um, your potential consumer that lives outside of your site, then it probably makes sense to consider publishing there. Perfect example for me is uh, the search engine journal audience much larger than anything I would have on my own personal website. So it makes a ton of sense to publish there um, uh, and build awareness there. And there are a lot of other kind of formats um, and places to publish. So when you're creating a piece of content, think about the other ways that that piece of content can be translated into something useful. Um, a great example is uh, uh, PowerPoint slides, audio files, um, video, right? So how do you repurpose that piece of content to be published across these other platforms, ultimately with the goal of linking back to that original piece of content? So now you're getting a nice ecosystem of content uh, and links back to the content where you're driving all of those um, uh, targeted users uh, into your site. So all right guys, that's it. Um, hopefully a few of these little improvements will um, not only improve your uh, audience's trust in your content that you're creating, but also Google's trust. Um, and so I encourage you to do some of these little things and see what happens. Thanks so much. Um, if you want the slides or the links,